All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and begin. I want to thank you all for coming and to first off wish you a happy Darwin Day, an annual international holiday celebrating the release of On the Origin of Species. And there are celebrations, both real world and internet, every year. And what I decided to do, I think back in about 2015, I thought, you know, every year I'm going to do an annual Heroes of Evolution talk. And what I try and do is pick a prominent uh, researcher, dead or alive, that made a major contribution in particular to evolutionary theory, but also as much as possible to the general layman's understanding of evolution as well. And so this year, I was very pleased to see that Svante Pavo was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And so he is someone who's been on my mind for a long time. In fact, when I was in graduate school, getting my PhD in molecular genetics and cell biology, the news of stuff he was doing was always popping up. And I was always thinking, that is really cool work. He would be basically extracting the DNA of ancient organisms, and it would always make the popular press. And so it was one of these things of a topic in science that ultimately um, I just think has a lot of great appeal. And then it's actually over time had a few interesting twists and turns and is something that um, has just become, as the technology, again, it's important here that the, the technology of sequencing has really advanced and he's been at the center of that, that um, it's become a really interesting good story for everyone. So again, compared to a lot of my science circle talks, this one will be a little bit more light on data, a little bit more, more emphasis on the impacts. And I'm also not gonna cover all Sante Pabo's publication and research history, just basically focus more on the stuff that led to the Nobel Prize and is more specifically relevant for, for understanding evolution. So he's a Swedish citizen. Uh, now, interestingly, his mother was a chemist and his father was a biochemist. And he himself was actually a Nobel Prize winner. So he's one of, I think, about seven pairs of people uh, where a parent and a child ended up winning um, a Nobel Prize, not necessarily the same one. As a European Molecular Biology postdoctoral fellow, he moved to the United States in 18, sorry, 1987, uh, going out to, <clears throat> again, another one of their prominent research institutions, Berkeley. And that he joined a lab that was interested in the genomes of extinct animals. So again, one of the um, you know forerunners in that type of field. His career advanced. He, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of those publications during that time, his early years. And he, in 1997, became the founding director of the Department of Genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. So again, this term, you know, evolutionary anthropology is really in certain ways a relatively young field. And then what his particular subset of that is what's known as paleobiology or paleogenetics or even molecular anthropology is really just a new field that he was one of the prominent founders of. In 2007, he was considered one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Now, a part of that, of course, is because of the research he was doing in paleobiology. But I think it's also important to recognize that from his early research successes, he joined many of these high throughput sequencing companies. And these high throughput sequencing companies were really coming to prominence in lots of areas, lots of fields of medicine, genetics, genomes and so that was a part of i think the influence there not just the paleobiology but the fact that he was helping enable this important and again useful in many ways technology and in last year awarded the nobel prize in physiology and medicine quote for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution and why these discoveries are important, and I'll come to this at the end, but I'm telling you the end of the, the last page of the book, 
up front here is that by having comparative genomics, we've learned from comparing human to chimpanzee, human to ape, even human to, um, you know, macaque, uh, bush baby genomes, that there's important things we can learn about how genes influence our biology. And this sometimes can come down to very important medical conditions or even just baseline physiology. And so the fact that Zvante Pabo was so involved and the premier person at finding our closest extinct relative, again, we're talking about in the old days comparing genomes where we know there's a common ancestor and both exist at the same time. But very rarely, well, I would say it's unprecedented at this point to have a close cousin where the uh, the cousin species was extinct. And so, the, but the fact that we can bring so close that common ancestor to that comparative analysis ends up being actually really useful in a lot of cases. And we'll talk about some of that, but I really think this is really the beginning of a lot of those comparisons. And so we'll see a little bit more of it as uh, people, even beyond Svante Pabo, work on it. All right, so let's get into it. You know, the main concerning thing is ancient DNA. And, you know, the old school ways of looking at archaeology, anthropology, was digging up bones, comparing bones. And that was a lot of times what you were left with. Now, there's a lot that's come along the way where we can do, you know, electron microscope scanning to learn more about certain tissues and other stuff. But those can only lead to so much insight. Now, of course, in human comparisons, you can compare other archaeological finds that are not biological. But in terms of really understanding genomics, this, this is the main point. And there's a challenge here, right? Because what you see here is a person in old timey dies, their body is preserved enough that we can actually understand that there is a body there in modern day times. And what's left behind is their tissue, including DNA. Now, I want to make a quick note here. A lot of the early paleogenetics attempts were to look at mitochondrial DNA because you have many more copies of that available in your archaeological sample. You have that tissue, and for every one, sorry, for every like two copies of the genome DNA, you might have hundreds of copies of the mitochondrial DNA. So that's always um, a first part. Now, there's a limitation to that, which is mitochondria are only inherited from mother to child, never from the father. And, but what happens over time, and just, you know, anytime you think about anything, you even leave in the ground for about a year, you know, what do you see happen to it? It degrades, uh, it gets infiltrated by bacteria that are using it for food, all sorts of things happen to degrade it, including, you know, just oxidative chemistry damage from being in the environment. And so that chemical modification, those chemical modifications and all this contamination of other biological organisms was always one of the big challenges. And I think that this is while there was this early attempt to do some relatively basic, straightforward, apply molecular biology to see if you could sample and capture some of this DNA, what we've learned from Sante Pablo's career is that over long periods of time, sorry, over the development of the technology, that you're actually developing specialized technology for this purpose. These are things that you, while they might be related to modern applications of a developing sequencing and DNA capture technology, there are lots of examples where it's specifically developed for trying to capture this type of DNA. I think that's something where we should recognize those contributions, although I am not going to get heavily into those details because that's not typically how I want to do a Darwin Day type of talk. Okay, so what was Fate Pabo's early interest? And again, there's not a lot of biographical information, so I can't necessarily say much about what, what really spurred this on, was actually being very interested in Egyptian mummies. And so um, one of his early publications was actually the ability to capture from a preserved mummy the, uh, a stretch of DNA. Now, what was interesting is that the thought being, given certain preservation practices and also desertification. Again, one thing that's nice is if you have a very dry climate, then the amount of microbes that can contaminate your sample become less because there's just they, they don't have enough water to live and metabolize. 
Uh, on the other hand, you could imagine that preservation practices would also completely ruin the DNA. And I think that's probably ultimately what happened to the most well-preserved ones. And so among 23 mummies, they were able to capture one stretch of DNA. Uh, they were able to clone it and get some degree of sequencing off of it and able to just show that it was possible. So this was, uh, again, when he steps forward, it was very interesting, 1985, but in many ways using kind of classic uh, DNA technologies known at the time. But it's the type of information that, again, the review, and I have this in the, um, the, the notes, the work cited note card, and that's all available on the web. People are very excited about being able to look at ancient DNA to understand the migration, the alleles, the patterns of disease that you might see in um, ancient DNA, and also do that comparison to modern day DNA. Uh, for example, sickle cell anemia understanding is actually has helped people understand migration patterns in uh, ancient Africa. Okay, so, but the exciting stuff, the stuff that was making the news uh, during my graduate day times and my postdoc times was this looking at ancient mammoths and sloths. Again, nothing tends to capture the imagination of the general press as mammoths and sloths for whatever reason, right? They're planning on reintroducing mammoths <laughs> based on genomic DNA uh, from this company called Colossal Biosciences just announced this year. And so the challenge though was this basic idea, like I mentioned, that that chemistry can mess up DNA. That even if you have something that's not contaminated, does the basic chemistry still work? And so the thought was that anything older than 10,000 years old, you basically was too could not amplify because it was too chemically damaged. But the thinking of this paper was, well, if we can find some well-preserved mammals that were in the permafrost, that maybe those extremely cold, stable temperatures would allow amplification given the techniques at the time. And in fact, that's what they showed. They were able to amplify uh, nuclear DNA sequences. So they didn't have to rely only on mitochondria. They were able to amplify nuclear DNA sequences and um, basically sequence and compare them. Well, no, so um, just, to, yeah, just to touch on the colossal biosciences idea is that they do want to reintroduce mammoths to the wild, primarily in, I think, Siberia, because they think it can actually help with reestablishing the ecology and basically the carbon cycle in a much better way that actually their, their argument is that they can help with climate change by reintroducing the woolly mammoth. We can, I can share you my thoughts on that later about whether that will be successful. Uh, Sumo, let's talk about it at the end, but I, it's a good conversation. We can talk about it at the end. Um, and so I just wanna give an example of from this paper, the types of information they're able to get out from just amplifying this genomic DNA. And so here's one of these, the genes I mentioned, the A2AB gene. And what you're looking at in this picture is you have the Asian elephant and consensus sequence, but notice it's only about 68 base pairs long, right? It's only 68 base pairs, not that long. But when you look down, the, the dots in every row below the top represent being the same sequence, the same nucleotide, but when there's a new letter introduced, that's saying, oh, it's differing from that consensus sequence at the top. And so what's really interesting here is that they were able this time to capture enough nuclear DNA. And if they were lucky about where they were finding it, they could capture information that was useful for developing phylogeny, resolving ancestral relationships between different animals. And that's what was, was interesting and, and useful about it. And then ultimately, what also other groups did more so than the Svante Pabo group was that once you had good primers, to an amplifiable amount of DNA for something, you could then also try to understand the archaic distribution of those animals within the habitats. And so you could understand maybe migration patterns or you know, even population levels in some cases. Uh, now, moving on, 2003, uh, also looking again at trying to resolve relationships of the sloth. And what they were able to show in this case is, again, the ability to find 
the advance here was with new techniques able to recover single copy DNA, again, genomic DNA, that also was from a warm, arid climate. And so this idea that they, um, that you have to be limited to permafrost type of samples with good preservation was apparently no longer true. And so basically this opened up new avenues, new ways in which people could broadly apply this across various climates and can various ancient climates as well. And what you're seeing here in the figure is just this example of where, in terms of looking at the, the ancient Shasta ground sloth, they were able to phylogenetically place it as being more closely related to the three-toed sloth as compared to the two-toed sloth, which of course was an argument that had led to many bar fights among paleobiologists, little known fact. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about putting this all together to really understand ancient organisms. Oh, Phil, actually, yeah, sorry, I didn't even mention that one part, that uh, um, what a coprolite is, just a reminder, that is preserved fecal matter, uh, specifically. And so, again, it's one of these things that people thought for a long time it might be very hard to capture DNA from that, because that's an extract that has a lot of biological microorganism activity going on in it. But if it's preserved well enough, then it actually does seem to work. And actually, the other thing that's really interesting, of course, about it is that if you were to think about the availability of sampling ancient DNA, then coprolites end up representing, what, 100 times the body mass of an actual fossilized animal? That if you could capture that information from coprolites, the availability of samples are is astronomically larger. And then you also can get insight from the diet that you had, not just what the animal did what the animal was phylogenetically, but also what it ate. And so those are, again, all things that became very exciting as people. Well, you can actually recover plant DNA, Sumo. You can recover plant DNA from, from corporalites, uh, other animal DNA. But then a lot of times it's, it's, the thing about it that the challenge is it's much more contaminated by microbial DNA. But in some cases, you can actually learn about the microbiome that an, an organism had. So lots of interesting stuff. So now, what I've mentioned so far are generally small amounts of DNA. They were starting to be able to capture whole mitochondrial DNA sequences. So you actually had the entire genome of the mitochondria for many animals. But when it comes to trying to understand, again, that nuclear DNA that tells you the most information about what's going on within a species, that was problematic. And the reason why, and what I'll show here, is how these were standardly put together with the technology. And that is, if you had captured some DNA, what you do is put what's called a primer on it, and then your captured DNA, you have a template, and you'd basically add all the DNA synthesis enzymes and chemistry you need to extend that DNA. And then what you see on the right-hand side, you see an example in the old days at this time of basically a radiograph where you put in what are called chain terminators so that you get a radiometric reading at every length at which you're substituting in a chain terminating C for a regular C, and then a chain terminating T for a regular T. And you get this population of molecules. But the key thing here, and this is what's important to recognize, is you need a pretty large population of DNA to work with to have that work very well. And a lot of times, ancient DNA, you just had very short segments because the chemical modifications and damage already in your template, your original template, already basically created chain terminators. And then assembling a genome, what I have shown here is like your standard old genome assembly technique, is that as you get lots and lots of single reads, just little short horizontal bars, in order to assemble that into a genome, you need overlapping sequences, and then you understand what the overlaps are between those chunks, and then you create bigger chunks, and hopefully you can keep going until you create chunks as big as the chromosomes themselves. And one of the challenges for ancient DNA is that it's very hard to get enough of these overlapping chunks because they were so chemically degraded or, um, you know, not representing 
the best regions very well that you just could not assemble them to make larger scaffolds and contigs and all these things. So one of the big technology revolutions was what are known as, as high throughput sequencing. And these in many ways relied upon a relatively different strategy, which was instead of trying to um, assemble, I'll come to that question in a second, Barry. And instead of trying to create multiple long reads using your standard technology, now what these machines do is use some very specialized types of chemistry to just only make short reads. So you notice the machine on the left, its read size was only 500 base pairs. On the, uh, the machine on the right, only 150 base pair reads. However, the copy number you'll notice is 500 million or 95 billion, which ends up being enough overlapping short DNA sequences that you can assemble genomes relatively easily. So Baragon does bring up a good point, and I wanted to touch upon this, that this is really great for mitochondrial genomes because you have short reads, the, uh, the, the DNA itself is not very complicated. It's very easy to find these overlaps even among short reads. Now the problem that comes up is something Baragon mentions is tandem repeats, but there are also other types of repeats known as repetitive elements. If you know me, you know talks I've given, I've talked about repetitive elements in genomes before, those really do complicate a lot of these analyses. So again, important to recognize that it's not an end-all solution to all this, but it can be a very powerful way to understand all of the unique coding parts of genomes by taking this very separate strategy of sequence as much as you can, and then do basically computational analyses later to clean it up. And that's what's shown here in the next slide. Again, I, th these last couple slides I've basically stolen directly off of, I should say fair use borrowed, off of the Nobel Prize lecture website, which again is also a citation. I, Svante Pablo's talk is very accessible if you want to watch it independently. But here's this very fresh strategy that now this new technology could enable, which is even if you have a relatively small amount of DNA, maybe not very many copies of it, maybe it's highly degraded. What you can do is if you're trying to assemble those blue segments is you just sequence everything, right? While you try and do as much as you can to reduce contamination, what you can do is just sequence billions upon billions of copies of DNA and then use computers to recognize where the blue, again, your target genome sequence is compared to all this other stuff you're getting. And what the red might represent, for example, would actually be human DNA, right? You're extracting these from sites, and then human DNA can be one of your contaminants. But because we know the human genome sequence, even though it might be similar to the Neanderthal sequence, we can positively identify it in many cases as being human. And then actually there are other chemical tricks you can use to sort out old versus young DNA as well. So this is kind of a good pausing point because I'm gonna get into all the genome stuff in just a minute, but anybody have any questions about paleobiology or how the techniques on this work? While you're collecting your thoughts, I'll mention that. I think one of the challenges for reviving the woolly mammoth based on sequence DNA will be they're gonna try and recover and use CRISPR to basically modify elephant genomes to be more like the woolly mammoth. The problem is unless you understand all of the repetitive elements that I think have very important transcriptional regulation controls, they've been modified to do that. What's going to happen is you might have all the genes in place, but you're not going to have all the regulatory control of all those in place. So I don't think it's as easy as they say it's going to be. Okay, Phil's amazed. If Phil's amazed, then I think we can move on. All right, so let's talk about publication history with, with hominin genomes. That 2008 was... Um, the publication of the mitochondrial genome of Neanderthal. And this came from an individual. This is important to recognize that the geography of this individual was from Croatia. So again, Eastern Europe. Uh, they were able to, again, put together 8,000 8, base pairs of sequence, but they used it from five gigabases of sequencing DNA. Uh, 
And so that's the important thing to recognize that, again, that technology enables this type of thing. Sorry, those are 8,000 se different sequence reads. The actual nucleotide sequence is 16,000. And so, you know, they put it together. They showed the conclusion that was really interesting, and this was big news at the time, was that the mitochondrial DNA did not match anything in modern humans. And I remember there being, um, I think there was even a whole Nova special about this type of stuff. But if you look at this phylogenetics down here in the lower right, lower left-hand side, that little red dot is, the, they're saying, the split of Neanderthal from modern humans. And so there's no cross-contamination, there's no representation of Neanderthals. And so the conclusion, so and then the right-hand picture is just showing this in a more graphical sense, that where is this overlap? And because the red does not overlap the black, then humans and Neanderthals, the conclusion was they were ancestrally related, but never interbred at least based on a mitochondrial inheritance pattern, right? So they're saying they did not interbreed. Which of course then made 20, uh, 2010 an interesting year when they sequenced up the human draft, the genome of the Neanderthal. Well, yes, Sumo, you're pointing something very interesting out, is that when they published the whole draft sequence, and again, I only have apps, access to the uh, abstract for this paper, so I can only recapitulate what's there, is that when they compared that Neanderthal genome to present day humans, they identified a number of regions that may have been affected by positive selection. Uh, genes involved in the types of things you might expect, um, things that might be different in metabolism or cognition. And the conclusion was that we share a lot of genetic variants, which means we must have interbred at some degree of overlapping time. And one thing that they could do by doing this comparison, and you'll see this come up in the maps I'll show multiple times, is that Neanderthal interbreeding with ancient Homo sapiens only occurred really outside of Africa. That as, that however the human migration patterns worked, they left, they interbred with Neanderthals in a wide, actually a relatively wide amount of space, but that Neanderthals never went to Africa. There's lots of arguments to say that Neanderthals were particularly cold adapted, um, but that really the gene flow back in Africa was, was zero, non-existent for Neanderthals. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit more about this positive selection. Positive selection is a term meaning that the amount of that gene, that particular allele of it, increased in the population probably because of some useful selective purpose that was existing at the time. Okay, so the other fun surprise in this whole story was that when they were randomly sequencing uh, a sample, again, a small little bit of a finger bone, and this was in Denosova Cave, which is in the Altai Mountains in southern Siberia, they looked at the DNA and said, well, this is not human, but you know, it turns out this is also not Neanderthal. And so um, from that, they said, hey, there's another branch of human evolution, of hominids. Exactly, Phil. They just came along, weren't expecting it. And so what this is showing here, and there's a little bit of a graphic representation of this, is that their estimates for what happened in the branching was that about a million years ago, Neanderthal and humans had a common ancestor and then branched. And then within that branch, that is what led to Denosovans and Neanderthals. And so that's the relationship between all those. And so, um, uh, and, and then the branch point between Neanderthals and um, Denosovans was more like, I think 600,000 years ago based on that. But the other thing too is that really made the representation, given the dating and the time of these s s sample remains, that it probably meant all three branches existed at the same time between 30,000 to 50,000 years ago. So then that became this question too of, well, now that we have this Denosovan mitochondria, can we get the Denosovan genomic DNA and just like with the Neanderthal draft sequence, see a signature of that in modern day humans? And Baragon, again, that brings up an interesting question, which has not been answered, right? So the absence of human DNA 
in Neanderthal mitochondria, or I think what you're actually meaning is that the lack of Neanderthal um, DNA signatures in human mitochondria, maybe the only way this worked was Neanderthal men interbreeding with human women. And so that I've not really seen anybody give a good answer to that. And we can speculate a little bit at the end, but let me let me just push that conversation off to the end. Okay. So what they showed in this paper in terms of looking for the existence of Dudosevin DNA signatures in human genomes was that um and then also having the genomic DNA, they give them a better resolution of these divergence times, is that uh, human diverged from Neanderthals and Denosovans more like 800,000 years ago. And then Denosovan Neanderthals, they had a common ancestor that diverged at about 600,000 years ago. Now, what's interesting is that the signature of Denosovans relatively limited in human populations, but there's a relatively high percentage of it in Melanesians. And so this map here is showing an extraction from their paper that if you think about Micronesia, Polynesia, uh, the islands, the larger islands right above Australia, but not Australia itself, you see a pretty good, good signature of the Nosovin DNAs. But remember also, the, the likely crossbreeding of this probably actually occurred back in Siberia. And so something happened there that then later human migrations led to this. Although again, we don't know all of the geographical location of all the Denisovans either. Right, so Aurora points out something too, which is, and that, this is a number I wanted to just gloss over, but I think it's important to recognize is that within human populations, if you take probably all the humans, sequence all their DNA and asked how much of the, of the Neanderthal genome is covered, is represented, they think we can recover about 40% of the Neanderthal DNA within the genome within the existing human population. However, the, va the, the, the fixation of Neanderthal DNA into humans is mostly concentrated in Europe, again, ancient European populations, and it's typically anywhere between 1.6 to 3.5% or something like those numbers. So almost all of this, again, if you go to 23andMe, and we'll come back to 23andMe again later, they will tell you how much Neanderthal DNA you individually personally have. Um, and again, which, which part of the Neanderthal genome might be very different. But we'll talk about, from an evolutionary point of view, which regions that might be likely to be. Okay, so um, once, so in the, in the Altai um, mountains, they also were able to capture a much better purified genome from Neanderthal. So this is known as a more high quality genome sequence, and they wanted to make some other uh, inferences about it. Baragon, just remind me about that question a little bit later. And so um, when they took this high quality sequence, they make the estimate that, again, the, the particular proportion of amount of DNA that you have, again, now that you could resolve a lot of the smaller differences in nucleotide alleles and really map this a little bit better, is that in general, the amount of Neanderthal drive DNA in people outside of Africa is anywhere between 1.5 to 2.1%, although that would be nudged up a little bit higher within the ancestral European populations. And then they also could do a better comparison of Neanderthal to Denosovans. And what they found was something a little bit better. They found certain signatures in human leukocyte antigen region and the CRISP gene cluster in chromosome 6, which, both of which are involved in immunity and sperm function. And so this interesting little inference about immunity comes is interesting because we will see in repeated fashions that perhaps one of the best values that you can get by having interbreeding with a more distant population are things that are affecting, and you can see these signatures because you have very strong selection from pathogens. Again, pathogens are the things that sweep across populations and can lead to very strong selective pressures. And I think the best example that people always talk about with this is the Black Death, also known as bubonic plague in Europe, where in its first pass, it killed two thirds of the population. And then every subsequent epidemic, a small number of people uh, 
passed away from it because there were genes that enhanced people's immunity to it. Those were the survivors. And that's evolution. That's how evolution works. Okay, so here's a little bit of a map that they put together, which is, again, showing the branch points, not necessarily in time, but giving some degree of the branch points of these different hominins and showing you in these orange arrows where there seem to be specific gene flows from introgression crossbreeding. And so you'll see uh, some of the Neanderthal genome pass into Denosova, but that more was only limited to Siberia that weren't the European Neanderthal populations. Whereas the European Neanderthal populations clearly branched into uh, the Homo sapiens, although at a point after the migration out of Africa. And then you can also see some other Denosovan um, split uh, integration into uh, very specific subpopulations of the human population, those that, as I mentioned, seem to be representative of uh, Pacific islands. And then what's also interesting here is that there's enough signature from, from the DNA that we look at the genomes and compare them, there seem to be these islands and haplotypes of yet another unknown hominin that has interbred with um, denosovans. And so there are no archaeological samples that represent that actual genome, but by comparing, having enough DNA information, you can say, hey, there's something extra in here that's not, that's not a part of these species. Okay, so while I think it's really important to recognize um, the power of these to understand paleobiology and to understand human migrations, understand this, that's not, that's not going to win you a Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology. And what's really, I think, the last part of the story is that the power of having these genomes and looking at these signatures has led to advances in understanding the medical pathological conditions of humans as compared to Neanderthals. So here's the first example. This is just an interesting one about a nerve receptor protein. And that nerve receptor protein is different between Neanderthals and humans. And they did a couple things to characterize this is that one, if you look at a sample of British people, that where you have both their genomics, their allele, and also some sort of other sampling data, you can ask them, you know, things about their lifestyle, and they say they experience more pain than others. And then, then also you can do physiology. You can basically take this back to the lab and compare the expression of the physiology of these with molecular biochemical assays and compare the difference. And that's what they found is that the this nerve receptor shows reduced inactivation, meaning it's sending more and more of a signal back to the brain. And so because the, the suspicion they have is that this is a pain receptor, and so their argument is perhaps Neanderthals are more sensitive to pain uh, than humans. Again, we don't know, but that's, but this is the type of analyses that then when you have this comparative genomics and you have sample size data, and you can do some molecular biology on it, you can make these inferences. Another great example is the uh, progesterone receptor. And so uh, progesterone is important for preparing the uterine lining for egg implantation and maintaining the early stages of pregnancies, as well as, again, it's involved in the menstrual cycle as well. Uh, again, if you, does anybody know of any particular drug that might relate to pro progesterone offhand. What they showed is that these are different between the Neanderthals and humans, and that given what we know about modern day progesterone, is that this can have a consequence for carrying pregnancies to term. And so I wanna just focus a little bit on the map here for a second. What these pie pieces are showing that the, the orange slice represents a, more representation of it within that population. So again, you'll see in Africa, very small, in Europe, a lot higher, but then you also see it in 
the Western world populations and within Asia as well. And Aurora points out, an, a, a, I think, a useful thing to, to recognize is that genes that actually help you with directly with fertility <laughs> and the amount of children you can have ends up being a very powerful thing uh, in terms of human evolution, in terms of a what's called a positive selective factor. And so in following up on this, you know, when they look at that particular polymorphism and they, again, use a comparison to the UK biobank when they can identify different patients and given different descriptions of what their pathologies or why they went to the hospital is they found a so-called negative association between the Neanderthal allele and hemorrhage in early pregnancy. And so what, and then also reporting less or fewer miscarriages within that population that if you're a carrier of the allele. And so, and then also looking at just overall census data, you can see that those individuals carrying the Neanderthal allele had significantly more sisters, although interestingly, not an increase in the number of brothers. And so these, again, somewhat indirect logic and reasoning, and again, inferring from extant data, is that these may reduce the frequency of miscarriage, although, this is, in a sense, competing against the fact that the lower progesterone levels and receptor levels might mean that fewer pregnancies implant well in the first place. So you might have a somewhat lower fertility in terms of implantation, but it seems like the net effect is that, is that the, the dryer is done, is that you do have it, an, a net impact that's positive for fertility. And also, and I think this is where the sister information comes in, is that remember one of the causes, one of the major causes of death for women is, you know, death during childbirth. And so the fact that you have adult sisters that are more prevalent from the statistical data may indicate that in fact, less miscarriages, less issues with pregnancy. So here's something that you may have heard the news, and I, I have to apologize yet again for bringing COVID back into the conversation. I know lots of people are sick and tired of hearing about COVID. But this was an interesting set of data that came from an analysis by 23andMe, right? So 23andMe is a company that has a huge amount of biological genetic information about people, and they basically sent out a survey to their subscribers, people who sent samples, again, after the fact, and said, how bad was your COVID? And so what the graph on the left represents are signatures of correlations between severe COVID, not necessarily the prevalence of COVID or having COVID, but actually having severe COVID specifically, and a potential allele signature. And so you notice there's a very big spike on chromosome three, and the right-hand image shows the set of genes that are in within that signature area. And what's being represented there in the, um, the red are the genetic variants that are correlated to the risk variant, and those risk alleles match this one particular Neanderthal genome. And that black bar at the top, that black bar, that's basically a haplotype, again, a whole stretch of DNA that is from Neanderthal. So, what did we learn about that? So again, here's the signature, seems to be correlated to Neanderthal, of having Neanderthal DNA makes you more susceptible to severe COVID. And then here's the geographical distribution of this. And you'll see, again, low in Africa, a, a decent signature in Europe, but interestingly, a pretty high prevalence of this gene in that you know Middle Asia region around India. And so the interesting follow-up to this, and I think this is really important, is that that DNA segment may also relate to the expression of something known as CCR5. And when a follow-up paper, again, Svante Pabo didn't publish this, but the person who published the COVID-19 paper with him published this by himself, showed that these individuals with this particular gene segment that is susceptible to severe COVID is actually protective against HIV infection. And so this is one reason why it may be a relatively prevalent um, gene in certain populations is that it was protective and a survival advantage in places where HIV was also prevalent. And so this is the, 
as P Sante Pabo put it in his talk, the double-edged sword sometimes of evolution. Now there's another variant that came out that seemed to connect with uh, Neanderthal genome to less severe COVID. And again, I don't know a lot about the biology of this one in particular, but what they showed is that a set of genes that are involved, that encode work known as oligo, so oligoadenylate synthetases. And these are things that are involved in immune responses, as well as being involved in double-stranded RNA. So again, double-stranded RNA is something that comes from, you're right, invading viruses. Uh, so the fact that there does seem to be this um, prevalence, and you can see a worldwide distribution of this, there may be some positive selection, in particular, of places that have gone through other types of maybe even specifically coronavirus infections, where this was a survival advantage for them in the past, and then you've retained some of the survival advantage with a new infection, the new COVID-19. So Sumo, yeah, just to point out that, again, there are two things that go on when you think about these pies, is that in both cases in Africa, if you don't have the Neanderthal genes there, you can't have a positive or negative selection for them. But then when the Neanderthal genes are there and available to go through evolutionary forces, you can see different amounts of them coming back and forth. But again, that actual selection, those actual increases or decreases in percentages will reflect the living history of those individuals and the pathogens they face, in this case, over time. So that's kind of why you see some similarities uh, but then also there are going to be some differences between the two. So, for example, if you look back at the previous one, um, you know, the amount of stuff happening in the North American population seems to be a little bit less, whereas you have a lot more of it here in this particular one. So, anyway, um, last couple. Um, another example, looking at metabolism differences, is that one thing we don't, we, we, need, we have genes to protect us from oxidative stress, because oxidative stress is something that's very damaging to the molecules in, in the cells. And one thing that we, that you could look at is the fixed, the fact, the fact that there's something known as fixation, which means that at some point in time, all humans had the fixed version of the gene, 100%. I mean, other words, fixed means 100%. And then it wasn't until later that in breeding, interbreeding with Neanderthals that got introgressed back into humans. And again, when they look at the prevalence of it, they see uh, a relatively larger signature in Indian, Sri Lankan, Puerto Ricans, Bangladeshis. Uh, but a lot of other world genomes don't show this allele. And they find it, again, when you actually look at what these genes are involved with, they're involved in immune mechanisms, or other types of chronic diseases like inflammatory bowel diseases. So a, the, what the images show here in this case is again, while some chemical assays, you did not see very much of a difference between those particular enzymes between humans versus Neanderthal, but that in other cases, when in this case looking at NADPH oxidation, or superoxide production, you can see the difference between the gray, the modern human version of the protein, the enzyme, versus the brownish Neanderthal version of the enzyme. So again, coming back to doing molecular assays to actually compare the biochemistry of these enzymes and how they're different. Okay, so yeah, Aurora, Aurora you're asking a question about, you know, what, what do we consider modern human? <laughs> I mean, in this case, you have a very specific consensus sequence where you can make the argument that the enzyme you're looking at is a modern human version. Now, when you talk about current North American populations, I, I believe, and again, I would have to go through the materials and methods, typically that just means you're geographically locating these people and saying they're North American. That's not trying to represent the old, uh, you know, either cross ocean or cross Alaska Ice Age bridge to say North Americans are specifically derived from those. Right now, sorry, uh, that's what I was just answering that. It's it's typically that's just going to be based on the geography of who is here. It's going to be based on geography, not any sort of racial inferences. Although again, there are ways that you can refine the data if you want to, but typically with these types of large global maps, they're not doing that. That, that would take the extra time and money. It's just geographic, this person was here. 
Um, another example gene is, again, coming back to metabolism, is cytochrome P450. And it's again encoded by the gene known as CYP2C9. And it's actually a pretty highly polymorphic gene in present-day humans. But um, this is an important enzyme we know about a lot because if you certain people that have this variant can actually get overdosed on things like warfarin, which is a uh, you know blood thinning reagent, and phenytoin, which uh, ends up being direct substrates of the enzyme. So if you are if you have a mutation, this the dosage of DNA you can get, sorry, dosage of a drug you can get can actually kill you, even though, you know, the vast majority of the population, that's not problematic. Um, and so related to CYP2C9 is also CYP2C8, which encodes, encodes another cytochrome gene and important also for metabolism of some other pharmacological agents. And what's actually interesting is that there are certain alleles, again, the asterisk 2 and asterisk 3 represent alleles, versions of these genes, and they tend to co-segregate. And what they actually found by with the high-resolution Neanderthal genome is that these alleles are both co-inherited from Neanderthal. So again, this is like one of these examples of a haplotype where that whole chromosome segment of two genes that are near each other ended up being inherited and then has maintained that haplotype through multiple generations of humans. Um, well, so Sumo, in this case, I just mean drugs that are known and actually prescribed to people in modern day. So warfarin is something um, that's commonly prescribed for people who had a heart attack. For example, um, again, I don't have it on the slide, but like the CYP2C9 asterisk 2 allele is about 14% of the European population, at least in one copy. That's its prevalence, not necessarily where it's homozygous. Um, and again, the reason sumo this is important, and it's not like xenobiotics in general, what it is is the biochemistry of what these enzymes do is specifically recognizing these and breaking them down. So again, drugs work in different ways. Sometimes you actually have a drug where the active version of the drug is what you imbibe, but there are actually other examples of drugs where the active version of it is what the liver metabolizes in a way. But in all cases, whatever pharmacological dose you have, that always is degrading over time as you clear the drug from your body. So in many cases, you're just pissing it out it disappears because it dissolves, it's a, a, a solute, and then you, you get rid of it that way. But there are lots of drugs where the dosing information is very relevant to how quickly the body specifically degrades it as well. And so in these cases, these are drugs where, you know, you think you're giving, you're giving them a normal dose because you're expecting it to get cleared out. So it's like, oh, take, you know, 200 milligrams every eight hours. That's based on its removal rate. And so if that removal rate is different because the enzyme metabolizing it is defective, then over time you're, do you're overdosing somebody based on those what's called pharmacokinetics. Okay. Um, so let me just give a quick summary of these genes that, um, you know, the nerve receptor is one that shows differences between Neanderthals and humans that may be relevant. There may be a signature of that in people reporting symptoms related to it. Progesterone receptor, again, something related to pregnancy, that very clear signature of this. Again, CCR5, which I put in here indirectly because it's an expression of the allele that they looked at, uh, again, enhances COVID susceptibility, while at the same time, it's maybe prevalent because it helps with HIV resistance. And then OAS 1 through 3, again, involved in viral defenses. And in fact, the Neanderthal one maybe seems to be given a signature that makes it better and enhanced against uh, COVID-19. They actually showed in that paper, too, that it helped against MERS and maybe even COVID-1. And so a little bit of, again, more in-depth study was interesting there. Uh, glutathione reductase, immune inoculated metabolism. Again, and this was the power of looking at these various biobanks as well as, you know, registries of people's symptoms and diseases and things they went to the hospital for is you again see a signature for things related to diseases related to that but again it's not as clean cut as a sickle cell anemia 
And then these last two, maybe things related to drug metabolism. Now, if you go through Svante Pabo's publication history beyond what he talked about in his Nobel Prize talk, there are a couple other interesting genes that, that they've done comparative genomics with, including uh, FOXP2, which involved is maybe in language and speech development, uh, KIF18A and KILN1, which are involved in chromosome separation metaphase growth, which along with NOVA1, may reflect differences in how brains develop. And so that's actually one of these big questions that you have is what really distinguishes Neanderthals versus humans? Could it be their use of language, their use of tools? Could there be things having to do with their brain development? Were Neanderthals specifically cold adapted? That's why you don't see them in, north, in lesser climes. All these types of things are the types of questions that are very interesting. Um, so here's a slide that I, I put it in here and maybe you can review it later. I just wanna make one quick point is that really this is from a review of looking at ancient DNA analysis and the various different landmark things that occurred during that period of time. And you'll see that really he starts it at 1984 when the first archaic DNA sequences were, were captured. And then things have progressed both in the wet lab as well as what's known as the dry lab, another way for saying computational analyses and whatnot. And I do sometimes wonder that maybe there's still another Nobel Prize for chemistry in the works for Svante Pavo, given how much he was involved in both ends of the companies involved in sequencing, uh, the genomic sequencing and other aspects of, of these types of techniques. But this is kind of the history. It's a good, and that paper is a nice review of, of the history of modern techniques if you want to get more in depth into the technology. Now, like I mentioned, Svante Pabo, relatively quiet person. He's never been, as far as I know, he's never been parodied on The Simpsons. I could find anything about South Park with him being in that. And so, you know, I'm a little disappointed because I wanted to show something cute and funny. But he did write a biography, an autobiography, Neanderthal Man of Search Lost Genomes, where he talks a little bit about his life. And he has been, for example, in prominent documentaries, been someone who's interviewed. Although, <clears throat> the... Um, the, uh, if you look on YouTube and look for interviews with Fonte Pabo, he's all over the place and he's represented in, in a lot of modern media. Anyway, so for these reasons, for the power and the investments and the knowledge and discoveries he's made in the history of analyzing archaic DNA, but then also in the ability to do comparative genetics, uh, really get involved in the biochemistry and understanding those differences between humans and other genes. And those ended up being many cases relevant and in the future we expect them to be increasingly relevant to understanding human medicine and physiology. Uh, Svante Pabo is my 2023 hero of evolution. So with that I will be happy to take any questions or clarify things and um, any comments that you guys might have. So thank you for your attendance and coming today. Yeah, no, i glad I could talk about it. Again, he was someone that I just always, whenever I saw publications come out when I was going through my professional development. Oh yeah, just a quick mention, Barragon is hosting Naked Scientists in two minutes. So if you want to go listen to um, that podcast from, nature, from, from, I think, Nature in the UK. Again, Barragon's not getting naked. So that's not what that's about. Yeah, so Abba, you bring up a really interesting point, and that is, you know, early on, there was a lot of bias in terms of how people thought Neanderthals and humans interacted, and of course that bias came down to saying, oh, humans are just superior, so we outcompeted them, and we just basically beat them off, and we didn't interact with them, we were just better. And one of the, the rationales behind that was some early physiological data where people said the Neanderthals, I think, had shorter throats. And so maybe they couldn't enunciate as many things as well. So their language capacity was just not good. But I think, you know, with more time, more research, and even the genetics, we don't see those, we don't see signatures of obviously one being inferior to the other in the vast majority of those. Although I will say that um, 
you know, when they did this organoid, if anybody saw this that came out, I think about two, uh, maybe just last year, where they're trying to compare Neanderthal genes in the development of brain organoids. Again, organoids are like a tissue, like organ assembly little tissues you have in a Petri dish. See you, Chantel. Thanks for hosting. That the human ones were a little bit more complex than the Neanderthal ones. And so there's some argument that maybe, again, when you think about overall cognitive brain, intellectual capacity, maybe there still is a signature that's different between those two. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Keisha. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah no, I think, I, think it's, I think it's unfair to say Neanderthal behavior. We think they were actually much more sophisticated than we were. Well, so no, Aurora, um, okay, so the term species, we have to be a little clear on what we mean by it, is that we, we would still characterize them as separate species because for the vast majority of their interactions that they had enough divergence time, again, 800,000 years is enough time to be your own, considered your own species. However, the barriers to interbreeding were not 100%. And so it's like the idea of a horse versus a donkey versus a mule. You still consider the horse and the donkey to be separate species because there's enough genetic separation to say that they are their own species, even though they can interbreed and make, you know, a, a still hybrid offspring. Does that answer your question? I hope. But I think one thing that, um, yeah, so I, I kind of bypassed this because it wasn't Svante's work, but um, as far as we can tell, Neanderthals were redheads. And so um, we believe, although this is not this is not 100% the case, uh, that some of the redheadedness you have in humans probably came from Neanderthals. But I haven't looked up a lot of the paleogenetics of that particular gene, but I... That's one example. I don't know about the blue-green eyes being a Neanderthal thing that's prevalent in humans because of Neanderthal interbreeding, but um, again, it's not one of these ones where you, when, when you compare genes of Neanderthals versus humans, the ones that I gave examples of were, in many cases, clear examples where you could distinguish Neanderthal versus human, but there are lots of examples of alleles where, because they're highly polymorphic and really... Um, subject to a lot of mutation pressures or, or selective pressures. Maybe we also don't have enough multiple read information from the Neanderthal genome. It's really hard to exactly say where they came from. So I think that's an important point too. Stephen, uh, yeah. pardon me while I geek out a second here, folks. Um, I, I want to go back to that business about uh, a sensitivity to wolf and being uh, Warfarin being associated with a Neanderthal gene. I mean, Warfarin didn't exist back then, but Neanderthal, uh, but uh, Warfarin is a Coumarin. And I wonder yes. if this, and, and based on what we're saying now, with this in mind, does that indicate something about the Neanderthal's environment or diet? I mean, Coumarins are in like clover and stuff like that. And then Coumarins, I know, or uh, Coumarins are also light sensitizers. You know, if you, uh, uh, too many coumarins can, can cause you to, to, to blister and, and all that sort of stuff in the sun more than anybody else. And I wonder if that's all interrelated with this part of the discussion where Neanderthals are redheaded and pale-eyed, uh, which also indicates a lack of regular melanin, which is protective against the sun. I mean, I'm piling up a lot of stuff here, but what I'm getting at is, is what does this sensitivity uh, to warfarin being related to the Neanderthal gene, say about the Neanderthals. So soon you ask, yeah, this is that's really the big question that these always occur, right? And how much resolution can you get in really understanding it? And you really need to know a lot about the specific life history of an organism to come to good conclusions. And so we don't. My answer is we don't know uh, genetics. Genetics as a whole can only tell you so much about these signatures. And so, you know, but let me give you an example of like a correlative type of analysis, which is for the longest time, people did not understand why, why sickle cell anemia was so prevalent. Right? What, what is, why, do you, why do so many African-Americans have sickle cell anemia? 
And then it wasn't until you could correlate that with resistance to malaria, which again, one reason you could do that is you could basically do a geographic overlay of sickle cell anemia to malaria prevalence, and you could see the signature. Um, and so, you know, that's still one of the big downsides of Neanderthals is we don't know everything about their habitats, what they were exposed to, what diseases they encountered. Like you're saying, maybe there was some pathogen or maybe there was some drug uh, in, in their food, in their potential food supply, like a potential poison in their food supply, where having resist, having a decreased ability to metabolize it was a survival advantage, but we just don't know, right? But that's the type of thing where once you have the genetic signature of something, then this can get people to ask those questions and to maybe explore it further and come to an answer. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, so Aurora brings up the northern climate adapted um, aspect of, of Neanderthals. Um, you know, we don't, I, I have yet to see papers that ex explicitly describe the genes that do seem to correlate with that. Other than, of course, the fact that they're very pale skinned, that does come back to the vitamin D conversation that um, the, some people wonder, and I don't know if they've looked through all the little haplotypes for this, but, you know, being fair skinned is a big advantage in northern climates where in the old days you needed UV light to make vitamin D and vitamin D is really important for like bone density and strength. And so Neanderthals may have a bunch of adaptations in addition to maybe just being cold adapted, but also to being low light adapted. And so the fact that maybe some of that guy got, got reintroduced into humans has what allowed humans to really spread outside of Africa. Some people made this argument that without Neanderthals, maybe humans couldn't have spread as far as they did. Right, but I think the majority of the interactions of humans that 30,000 to 50,000 years ago, that that, um, I think that's still considered late Pleistocene, right, is we typically consider that to be a pretty cold time. That was really a little bit pre, uh, the major ice age was 10,000 years ago, but even preceding that 10,000 years ago, that was pretty cold. Yeah, no, no, I, I know I know what you meant, Aurora, that cold adaptation, in northern climate are there. You, you specifically talk about cold, but I wanted to bring it back to, well, something I knew more about, and that was vitamin D. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thanks, you all. thanks for all coming. Hope you all really enjoyed it. Uh, if there's anybody you think would be a great candidate for a hero of evolution, let me know. <laughs>